at me. Should I stay away? No, that's fine. Uh, first of all, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's my first trip since two and a half years. I forgot everything about it. Um, the title I gave, you know, some time ago um, while making the presentation, it's not going to be too much about um, the actual automation of things. I want to kind of step back to uh, a couple of details of uh, how we collect data nowadays uh, based on some new publications that came out and, and, and some uh, remarks that were made there. Uh, let's first start with uh, slide one. I'm using uh, this thing as my prop. Um, so we're doing uh, tomography. We want to tilt a sample. Uh, normally you'd say, I just tilt it. There shouldn't be any movement, but the height's going to be off. So in the end, if we tilt, there's going to be some movement, um, which means we have to correct for that. So we're compensating for a really bad stage. Um, on top of that, the alignment of the stage uh, can be a bit tricky on the microscope. So in uh, this slide, uh, you tilt about a point around the point. That point of rotation is not necessarily on the optical axis, which also kind of complicates things, but we can calibrate that. Uh, but this has been uh, the way we have to work. The stage technology is about 30 years old, I think, nowadays. Um, in the old days, so this is the earliest I could kind of pick up to, to find an image. Uh, we already started with, uh, you want to take an image somewhere, um, then along the tilt axis, you go next to it, you do focusing, you take a tracking image, you take an image, you tilt, you tilt, and then uh, you do tracking and focusing again. This was very, uh, very slow, uh, but everybody kind of accepted it. Um, in, 2000, in 2000, I started at FEI, uh, soon after FEI tomography was launched, which was based on um, a method uh, developed in Bram Koster's lab, where they did a pre-calibration of image shift. So you would put in a test sample, you take a tilt series, you record the shifts and the focus changes, and uh, later on you put in a real sample and you would take a tomogram and use the, the pre-calibrated shifts uh, to hopefully kind of minimize all the tracking and focusing steps. Um, the reproducibility of that was 400 nanometers. At the time, people were using three, four angstrom pixel size. Uh, kind of worked well. But if you're slightly off on the height or anything, it just wouldn't work. So it was a bit tedious. Uh, 2004, Tom Toolbox was developed in the Martins Reed lab and Baumeister's lab. Uh, that one did just full tracking. Um, if you have ever uh, had problems with Serial EM, this is the user interface of the Tom Toolbox. Uh, it, it did the job, but it, it somehow didn't really land that well. Um, 2004, it was UCSF, David Agar's lab, uh, Sean Zhang, who came up with a, uh, a prediction method and uh, what, they, what we call tracking after. So here you just set your centric height, you tilt, you take the next image, you measure the shift, and then you predict what your next shift will be following a rigid body rotation model, um, which did a nice job when you're still at these low magnifications. Um, but not every stage follows a proper rigid body rotation model. So that was a bit of a, a, bit of a problem. Um, to, that's where I got the first figure from. So on the left here, again, you have to uh, set the height. So that would be the, the, the Z, so to speak, of the point P. And you have to compensate for the offset between the optical axis and the stage tilt axis, which would be N0 in this, in this picture for point P. In FEI TOMO and nowadays thermo scientific TOMO, this is called optimized position. In Serial EM, this is called tilt axis offset. Um, did a nice job, but not every, not on every stage. So then uh, in 2005, uh, David Mastronade came up with this uh, prediction and tracking, and then actually tracking before and tracking after. So this really combines everything. You, you tilt, you have a choice to do tracking. You can also say, no, I don't want tracking, just prediction. Uh, it starts to predict stuff. Once you have four points, um, it will predict the next one. There will be an error margin on that. If you go over a certain amount of error, it will say, you know what, I think I'm going to take a tracking image here. So it's, it's a combination of things. And that worked out really well on every stage. That's kind of the strength of Serial EM. It doesn't matter how bad your stage is. It doesn't matter how bad the alignment uh, was left by the service engineer. Serial EM will do the job. Then, um, Another thing that never really landed, which is kind of weird to me, is um, UCSF TOMO, so the prediction model, was put into Legion on. But then they also implemented that you could do a pre-calibration and you could also do tracking. 
And what was nice there is that all the shifts from previous tilt series were stored in a database. Because Legion has this nice database underneath, um, which to me made sense because it's 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 kind of com combines the pre-calibration, historical shifts, and stuff. Uh, it never landed. I have never tried it because um, yeah, you know, every time I look into how to set up Legion on, I kind of gave up after a week. Um, but I think I still think it was a it was a really good idea. But I recently checked with with Anchi uh, if if it's used for tomography a lot, and she says no, not really. And the same goes for UCSF Tomo. I asked David, Agard, and I think they're also running Cerulean now. Then, um, and this was all you know. All these things were like to 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 gain speed in data collection. So, recently, uh, Grant Jensen, Grant Jensen's lab, uh, tried to kind of speed up things. They had a new Krios with a, what's called a single tilt holder. The old Krios has had a, a dual axis holder where you could rotate the sample. Uh, nobody was doing dual axis TOMO anyway, so they switched to a single tilt holder and it, it turned out to be a much more stable than the previous uh, systems. So he explored continuous tilt, basically what you do in micro ED, which means you just image while you tilt the stage. Good idea, but uh, you get tremendous vibrations, as seen in, in, in figure A here, from the continuous tilting. So in Fourier space, you see there's a massive cutoff from the vibrations that the stage kind of puts into the microscope. Um, another thing they checked while doing that was uh, fast incremental tilting. So you tilt, you stop, you take an image, you tilt, you stop, you take an image. Well, they were not taking an image. They basically start a video stream, and then you just stepwise go through the tilts. And that still gave quite, um, an improvement, but they were not doing really any tracking. They were just relying on the stage being really, really good. Then uh, Fabian Eisenstein said, okay, uh, what we can kind of measure these shifts up front uh, for a step, a stepwise system and, and to bring the shifts all back in, which is great. And basically is the same thing that uh, Bram Kostel did in 2002. So uh, that kind of improved stuff already. Then recently, um, Alberto Bartosagi's group, uh, together with Mario Borknia, they came up with uh, doing prediction and also doing multiple areas in one tilt series, so using beam shifts, so kind of the same as the, the AFIS stuff in, in EPU, to get a lot of tomograms basically in one tilt series, from one tilt action, so to speak. Um, Looks nice, I haven't tried it because you have to set up a, a Linux box with all kinds of stuff and I'm a complete command line noob. So uh, you know, it would take me forever to get that running. But it, 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 the, the, the principle sounds very sound. Although they also used it for uh, what they call constrained single particle analysis. So um, I haven't seen it yet on, on, on Lamella. Then uh, Fabian Eisenstein kind of also came up with something like this. Uh, and that's 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 been this preprint since uh, since recently. Where well, they kind of do the same thing. So they start tilt series. You do multiple positions on your first one. The first one you set up as your tracking position. Um, that one basically suffers from not knowing what what the stage is doing on the next tilt. But once it does the tilt, it takes that image. It kind of calculates for all the other positions what how they would move. And that does follow a rigid body rotation model then versus the first tracking area. Um, What's important there is, what I found very interesting, is that uh, they did it on Lamella. And with Lamella, you have this problem that you go into the FIP, you mill them, they're under an angle, and then you put them in the TEM. And you would like this FIP Lamella angle to be at the stage tilt angle. The problem is you have to load these cartridges. So before you know it, you have a little bit of a rotation. So the Lamella is tilted, and then you're going to tilt the stage. And that causes a bit of a problem. So you can solve it geometrically if you know the offset of the tilt of the FIP um, tilt axis and the stage tilt axis. And that's what, what, what uh, this method basically did, which is great because, uh, well, it is great because sometimes, you know, first of all, you can try to load these, 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 cart these lamella uh, samples as good as you can with the tilt axis. But then some, you know, people that give it a lot of thought, a lot of effort, then you look at it in the microscope and these things are completely rotated. I'm like, no, but I really tried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the end it's like, okay, maybe something else is wrong. So recently I did a test. This was just last week. I loaded some grids, uh, finer grids. I oriented them. This was just at room temperature. So I get, did everything right. 
and then I loaded and unloaded them five times with an autoloader and took an image. And uh, is it running? No. Nope. And then you see this. This is just five times loading. Every time you load and unload, this thing starts to rotate. But it doesn't do it for all the slots. So it's still kind of a mystery that I have to work out. Um, but that's why I like the last method from, uh, from Fabian um, the most, because at least if it then has an angle, you can give that angle into his uh, script and it will deal with that when it tries to figure out, I set up these positions, this is the tilt, this is the rotation. So what's the Z height, the initial Z height of the other positions? And, and, and that really makes a difference, I think, in how it tracks stuff. So um, this, by the way, this is on a Clios G1 with a dual axis holder. Maybe that is a difference. I haven't measured the other systems yet. So that was just to kind of give a short overview of the, the limited knowledge I have about all these things. There's a couple more methods, but I think these one were really crucial. And now I want to move on to uh, a problem we had uh, years ago in the BRICS lab, which is uh, we were looking at, uh, what was it, influenza, Oliver Schreit, and uh, we were doing a, a bidirectional tilt scheme. So you start at zero, you tilt to one side, you go back to zero, you tilt to the other side. And this is a low Mac image, the starting image. Then you go to the high tilt, you go back, you have to realign things again. And that's the second image. And then we saw this, this massive uh, uh, deformation of the sample. This is the most extreme case. Not all of the, the, the tilt series had that. The red circle is kind of the beam. I always keep the beam small. I don't care if it hits the edge. And uh, this caused uh, also in the reconstruction, we could see that um, it caused a tilt in X. You can solve for that in IMOD, but it was just very difficult. And we can, we can never really get these atomograms out of that. So that was a problem. And that's where uh, I started thinking about, you know, what, what, what to do with these tilt schemes. So the first one that historically was done was a continuous tilt scheme. You start at high tilt and you just go to the other side. In cryo, the problem is you're at zero. You first have to tilt up to that high tilt and where you start while tracking things to keep your area of interest in the field of view. And that was tricky. So then later on, people said, okay, let's do bidirectional. That's basically the example I just showed. You start at zero, you tilt one way, you just sweep back, do a realignment step, you do the other side. And that's where we saw this damage. So that's where I then said, okay, what, what if we do with those symmetric tilt scheme? Uh, it was very stimulating. John Briggs told me it, doesn't, it won't work. Don't waste your time on it. Thank you for the motivation. And um, we had switched to a serial EM because we had bought a K2 which uh, there was no other software that it would work with. And Cyril had the scripting. So I wrote a script and I got it to work. Uh, but it was utterly slow. And that's basically where a lot of these recent papers come from. It's all too slow. Uh, and that's why I kind of ask myself the question now, where did things go wrong? So it was very slow because of the, the very ultra conservative tilting. I really did like zero, one plus side, two minus, Two plus, two minus. Yeah. Nowadays it's zero, two groups, two groups. You can do three groups, whatever, but it's never been, been, been really uh, benchmarked. So that was, that was uh, very cons conservative and maybe not needed. Uh, I was extensively measuring drift with that script because we were working on a K2, on a Krios G1 with a dual axis holder. We would tilt, track before, autofocus, um, take the image, and then take another tracking image after that and only then tilt. So the tracking after step was also active and that made that the, the image shift was really small. It was scripted, that makes it slow. Um, and there's no serial EM safety net. So if a grid bar comes in and you have black images, the script just plows on until it goes to the maximum angle where serial EM nowadays, if it sees a grid bar, it says, okay, I'm done on this side, let's finish the other side. And that saves a lot of time. Um, but at the time we were kind of averaging 45 to 50 minutes, I think, on a K2 for, you know, plus minus 60 degrees, 30 degrees tilt, so 41 images. A um, couple of things that I've noticed in the beginning is, uh, for instance, stage behavior. So I'm going to start this movie on the left, where uh, I'm going to put in uh, 70 tilt. So look at A and, and Y in the bottom. Uh, when we tilt up, so alpha is changing, and then you see Y change on the stage. It's the measuring system on the stage. It's a real movement. Um, and if you then tilt back, you will see that you're left with quite quite a lot of shift. You know? And that's just because the software was just moving alpha and the mechanical design of the stage kind of pushes uh, uh, Y. Um, and then I thought, okay, but, but if we just reset this to its original position before we started tilting, 
then we should have less shifts. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, that's in the second movie where I basically set X, Y, Z, and alpha to a certain position. And then you tilt somewhere. And once you're at that tilt, the software says, okay, let's reset back to the original X, Y positions. And by doing that, the reproducibility went back to about 200 nanometers. And you just get smaller shifts in total. Um, this took a while. So uh, FEI Toma had this since Andreas 2002, I think. I still do it in Cerulean and I get smaller shifts. So um, Cerulean also has it now. And in Cerulean, you can switch it on or off. Um, another thing that was important is uh, the tilt behavior of the stage. So I asked around uh, at Thermo Scientific, what's the accuracy of it? And we actually did many years ago uh, with, with Uwe Luca and Bert Freitag, we tested this. We took a silicon sample, converged with beam electron diffraction, um, and then you get a Kikuchi pattern, which is very, very sensitive for stage tilt. And then we measure like how accurate is it really? And it, it was very, very accurate. Um, so that's why I always say, you should in principle not be solving for stage tilt. Uh, there's backlash on the stage. If you, if you reverse the direction, there might be some backlash from just the mechanics. So that's why the original script always said, you always tilt in one direction. So you go plus direction, you just go up on the minus direction, you overshoot, you come back. You always come back from the same direction. Uh, the other thing I was doing was measuring drift because uh, there's a dampening curve that comes from drift. And here is just zero, one, two, three pixels of drift and how much it does on your dampening curve. And on the older scopes, uh, this was, you know, you had to take this into account. And what they then kind of advise is uh, 10 frames per tilt image. And for a K2, and I guess Falcon 4 is kind of the same thing. For certain pixel sizes, you then, on the left, you then end up with um, a drift spec on the right. So on, on an old Krios with a K2, I would still be measuring drift. On a K3, everything's so fast, it doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, I analyzed some drift data from tilt series. This was like a huge tilt series. So we have the tilt uh, angle on the x-axis and then y is the amount of drift in, in nanometer per second. And that's where I kind of knew like for K2, I have to be a bit careful. Um, some people have characterized their stages and say there's no drift, but again, not every system is the same. So it's something to be aware of. Focusing. Uh, focusing, there's a problem when you, uh, when you adjust the focus, there's uh, lens hysteresis. So depending on if you increase the current or decrease the current, you get a different magnetic field on the lens, so a different focus value. And uh, I did a test with that at some point where um, I just stepped up in focus, stepped down in focus, step up, step down. Um, bottom right, you, there's a, we did this, I did this in several steps. So uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and one micron. And then you see when you reverse direction, it takes a while until it does that actual step. You basically end up with about 80% of that step on, on the first steps. The first line is horizontal because I normalized the lens. That's why I was asking Tim Grant yesterday about his focus suite, how he was dealing with that. Um, and then I autofocus, you know, you measure focus. It says, okay, we're two microns off. Okay, correct it. And then I say, okay, that was two micron correction. Do another focus measurement until the last correction is less than 100 nanometers. Because then we know it's very accurate. At the time, I thought it was a good idea. We got good data and then nobody questions you. Later, I realized, uh, so this is a tomogram uh, from one of the data sets from, from Florian, where uh, we were applying dose filtering, dose weighting. And uh, if you then look, so on the left is just the, the tilt from high to low tilt, there's a Fourier transform. And in the bottom is a rotational average of that Fourier transform. And this is dose filtered. And then you see at zero, everything looks fine. And then that filtering kicks in. And this now makes me wonder, is that focus really that important? Because there have been people's papers recently where they didn't do the focusing at all. They just relied on the stage and prediction. And they got really good resolution. So that's something I still need to look into. Uh, tracking wise, I want to kind of give this example where uh, all this prediction and all, trying all these things is great. But as you go up in magnification, at some point, you just have to go back to good old tracking and it will be slow. So this is something we did, uh, for, when was it, Florian, 2014 or something. Uh, we didn't have a K2 yet. It was a GIF 2002, so a 2K CCD. Uh, and then we took uh, tomograms of uh, single virus particles. I call this lonely particle tomography. Uh, but at the time, it, 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 you know, because of the high mag and you have a good DQE, even on a CCD, it, uh, we managed to get the 7.7 angstrom. 
These tomograms took one and a half hours, by the way, because we didn't have frames, so we were waiting 30 seconds after each tilt, which was maybe a bit too much. Um, I'm going to skip over to this. Serial M calibrations are important, so pixel size, stage, and image shift, that's the normal stuff. The absolute tilt axis angle per magnification, that's an important one for me. Autofocus, and then autofocus having the beam tilt somewhat parallel to the stage tilt axis. And I use a, a wide half field of view when I take focus images. This is kind of the same thing that Julia mentioned, where she cops the images on tilted images. So I have a tilt. I will take the white half of the field of view, and I try to beam tilt in this direction, not in this direction. The tilt axis angle per mag, I typically calibrate it. This is a very high mag, and I take montage tilt series, so I get huge tracks for the gold beads to then solve them in IMOD and get a very accurate angle of what is the tilt axis rotation angle. For autofocus, uh, this white half thing and tilting somewhat uh, parallel to the tilt axis, to the stage tilt axis, helps in getting a sharper cross correlation peak. Because otherwise, if you do, uh, if you're on a tilted image and you would do a beam tilt method for autofocus, beam tilt like this, beam tilt like that, you have to stretch the images, uh, which works to basically get a, a cross correlation point instead of a elongated peak. All the software does the stretching. But what happens if you have a lamella with pre-tilt? So you go to a pre-tilt of nine, your sample is at zero, the stage is at nine, and the software will say, I have to stretch. So I think that's still something that needs to be changed in the software. Um, beam declination uh, has been a discussion for a while, where years ago already, uh, Achilles van Karkens group uh, realized that um, on a standard stage, at least the Thermo Fisher ones, you take a tomogram, you follow the beats, so the tilt axis is kind of that kind of that direction. If you follow the beats, you expect a line, but it wasn't. It was doing an oval, and that means the optical axis and the stage tilt axis had a little bit of an offset. So you get a conical tomogram. Um, that kind of gives problems in uh, reconstructions later on. Uh, David Masonada luckily fixed that in IMOD, so you can solve for it. And the nice detail is that. Uh, for the people that have fringe-free illumination on the Krios, they will change your stage height, and it happens to be in the right direction to minimize this beam declination. Um, so, I calibrate as much as possible, and I want to rely as much as possible on numbers on the microscope that I know are fine, tilt angle, tilt axis rotation, where I then say, okay, try to solve for the minimal amount of things uh, when you're in IMOD. So you don't have to solve for uh, the rotation angle because you get it from the header because you calibrated it with this montage with all these beats moving. That's the most accurate measurement. This angle doesn't change over the data set. So pre-calibrating it is very valid. We backlash the tilts. So we're always coming from the same direction. So I know that each tilt angle is accurate. So um, we don't solve for tilt angle either. If you wouldn't be backlashing, you would officially have to, well, you have to think about this branch does this, you come back, that branch does that, but there's a little bit of an angle difference between the two branches. Uh, and that's based on the stage adjustment. How tight is the alpha motor? You can sometimes feel it on the stage. Some, some have a lot of, a lot of wiggling there. But with backlash, you don't have to worry about that. If you have parallel illumination, your magnification will not be changing. So you don't have to solve for that. And uh, so that was all kind of my, uh, the thing I was uh, preaching. But then now so many things have happened where uh, I now have to ask myself, it's confession time, did I go wrong? Um, and it, in the end, it, it boils down to a lot of things just haven't been, been benchmarked yet. For instance, grouping. We're still doing, I think most people are doing very conservative groups of two. Why do we do groups of three or four? How much would it matter? We don't know. It needs to be benchmarked. Uh, tilt backlash, I'd say, is totally not a problem. It doesn't cost that much time. Uh, if, it's, if it's programmed well, you know, it's just I go to the other side, you overshoot three degrees immediately and just back off. So I think that should still uh, be done. Uh, measuring drift on slower cameras. It, it, I would advise people to, uh, to measure it at least a few times to see how your stage is behaving. Uh, there has been literature about, look how fast it stabilizes, but that's mostly on 
one of two systems, and very often on new systems. And uh, I, I, I just I just wouldn't uh, uh, completely rely on that on older systems because you know our older screen is you know probably done over 10, 10 15 thousand tomograms, and then the stage kind of wears out a bit. Uh, tracking. As you go to higher magnifications, you really need to track your, your field of view gets smaller, or we should get larger cameras, or maybe a better stage. Because you know, in the end, the, the 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 root cause of all these these things is that we have a bad stage. We can't just tilt and shoot and have a nice image. Uh, accurate focusing, I think I'm, I have to drop that now. Uh, you know, maybe we benchmark it first. It's always difficult if you get results to take something out without proving it and if then the sample was bad I will be the one to blame so that still need to we we still have to figure that out uh, and then tracking after an active tracking after so you you take your record image and then you take another trial image before you tilt helped a lot when I had the script to to take tomograms with a really small field of view 200 nanometers as I showed so and then with the Siri Liam controller nowadays uh, on K2 it's about 20 25 minutes and that's with the drift measurement. On K3, it's about 13 minutes. There's no drift measurement. Uh, still quite long. These new methods, you know, they come up with four or five minutes per, per tilt series. But um, if you really want to get to the very high resolution and you go up and you go to ever smaller pixel sizes, smaller field of view, I'm not sure yet if those methods really give you good enough data. So um, lots of stuff to figure out. Uh, the only other thing I have left is sample prep. Because that's another problem I have a bit with the with the new methods with the, the multi-hole stuff. Most of the samples I've seen where it's virus stuff, um, you'll never find, you know, a three by three matrix of holes that all have a lot of sample. It works nice if you if you freeze single particle samples and stuff, and um, and then to find these things. So here, this is just an example. This is a screenshot of a figure uh, for 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 a paper we did to to generate virtual maps to quickly. Uh, get maps at 15,000 and high magnification to realign to when you start taking tomograms. And this is, for instance, an example where in the, the middle right image, you see three uh, coronavirus particles. And, um, you know, from each grid square, I would maybe find three or four of those positions. I needed 50 grid squares. And uh, none of the high throughput methods would have helped. Luckily, we were in lockdown, so I had all the microscopes just for me. So it wasn't a big problem. But um, for most of the, 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 the typical virus samples, the stuff that you really can't do in single particle, we never found m m many holes together with good, with good distribution. And then the question is, are you gonna spend three days on a CRIOS to just get it done anyway, or are you gonna go back to the bench for seven months? And that's where I'm still kind of in the middle, but that's why I call this a sample prep problem. Um, and that's about it. And then I have to thank Felix Weiss, my fantastic colleague, in Heidelberg and Martin Schorp, who helped me with the virtual map stuff. Oliver Schreit, uh, from him I got the data from the, the, the influenza sample. Florian's tomogram. Uh, Will Wan, who made the tilt series movies. Uh, Twan van de Oetelaar and Uwe Lupe, with them I worked at the uh, Thermo Scientific at the time to work out the stage things. And uh, without Siri Liam, without David Mastronade, I, uh, I wouldn't have a career, I think. That's it.